who am I to deny what the Lord can do? God can do anything, can he not? Do you believe that today? Do you believe that God is in control? Well, to begin the message today, we're going to have a time of prayer. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And uh, as I've told you in the last few weeks, um, the song, you can go ahead and be seated. I know you're tired. In the Psalms, they were written as songs and as prayers to God. So to go along with what we're going to talk about today, here's what we're going to pray from Psalm 133. Here's what it says. This is what is known as a song of ascents, like ascending. You say, what does that mean? Well, uh, in this day, as they would go up the steps of the temple into the presence of God to worship God, they would read or quote or sing these psalms as prayers. And this is one of the ones that they would quote as they went into the presence of God. Here's what it says. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you know some things that are good, but they're not pleasant? You know what I'm talking about? Probably was good that I got spankings growing up, all right, because I needed them, I'm sure. Um, but it wasn't very pleasant. My wife says I need to eat more broccoli. And I'm sure it's good for you, but to me, it's not very pleasant. But here's what it says. For the people of God to dwell together in unity is both good, it's the right thing, it's what God wants, and it's enjoyable for you. It's pleasant. It's wonderful. Here's what he says. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. Now, you may not know what that's talking about, but it's talking about when Aaron, who was the priest, the brother of Moses, when he was anointed for service for God. And the oil, oil, oil always represents God's blessings. It always represents the power of the Holy Spirit. It always represents joy. It always represents good. And notice what it, the metaphor that it gives here, that when we live together in unity, when we have unity as a church, when as believers we come together around uh, what God wants us to come around, it's like an overflow. You ever just been around something that was like the overflow? It was just so good and it was just like it was bubbling over. Well, God says that's what it's like when you live together in unity. It's like God anoints it. God touches it. And it overflows with joy. And it overflows with blessing. And it overflows with anointing. God uses people like that. Then he says it's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. And what's the dew of Hermon? Well, representing uh, the blessing of God, like rain in those days, precious water, something that quenches the thirst of others. He said it's like that dew on falling on Mount Zion. Mount Zion was the dwelling place of God, metaphorically. It was where, uh, whenever it talks about Mount Zion, it's talking about our relationship with God, that we are with God, that God is with us. And then he says, from there, the Lord bestows his blessings. You want to get under the blessings of God? Get unified with a body of the people of God, with a church. Get involved, not just on the periphery, but he says, you want to get the sweet stuff. You want to get the good stuff. You want to live out of the overflow? He said, let the people be unified. He says, when that happens, he said, the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. You see, God wants to bless you. He wants to give you life. He wants to bring dead things back to life. That's why Jesus came not to make you good, not to give you a list of rules to keep. He came to take you from death to life. That's why he came. That's why he came. 
And so as we pray today, we want to pray that God will help us to come together. That he'll help us to live in unity. I'm going to talk about that today. How that Jesus prayed this for your life. Heavenly Father, help us as believers to come together in unity. It's good. It's the right thing to do, but it's also a sweet blessing. And Lord, when we do that, you anoint us. You allow your presence, your spirit, your power, and the joy of the Holy Spirit to overflow in our lives. And you pour out the blessing and you give life. Lord, that's what we ask for today. God, help us to unify. Help us to come together. Lord, we don't have to be exactly alike in everything, but Lord, we've got to come together around Jesus. And Lord, help us to do that. Bless us today. Help us to see people come to life just like you promised that you would do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today I want to talk about a prayer for church unity. Now, we started talking last week about some prayers. We we talked about that we're too busy not to pray. In other words, if we don't pray, then we're missing out. Some people say, oh, I'm too busy to pray, but I believe that we're too busy not to pray, that God wants to bless our life. And last week, we talked about a prayer for success. How do you do that? We talked about the prayer of Jabez. And today, I'm going to talk about a very unusual prayer in the Bible. It's actually the prayer of Jesus. Now, a lot of people, when you say the prayer of Jesus, they think the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're actually talking about a literal prayer that Jesus prayed, and it's found in the Gospel of John chapter 17. Now, the setting is that Jesus is just hours away from being arrested and tried and crucified. And one of the last things he does, he gathers his disciples together and he challenges them. He talks about heaven and they uh, take the, the Lord's Supper, the initial communion, and Jesus challenges them and then he prays. And I don't have time to read the entire chapter of John chapter 17. I hope you'll read it this week. We're going to talk about a lot of verses from this. But I'm going to read John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. And I want you to know that some 2,000 years ago, Jesus prayed for you. Now, I often have people come to me and say, Pastor, pray for me because of this. Or There's somebody that's sick. Um in my family, or pray for my kid, or pray for my job, or pray for my health. And uh, I I do pray. And I I think sometimes people think that pastors have like the bat phone to heaven, you know, we just kind of pick it up and tell Jesus, well, you know, so-and-so down here struggling, Jesus, why don't you pay attention? Well, God answers your prayer just as much as he does mine. But the truth is, Jesus prayed for us. Jesus prayed for you. Now, I can tell you this without question, having Jesus to pray for you is a whole lot better than having anybody that you know to pray for you, better than having the pastor to pray for you, better than having a prayer warrior to pray for you. When Jesus prays for you, you know that it's special. You know that it's something. So, I'm going to read a part of that prayer in verse 20. He said, Jesus said, I'm praying not only for these disciples. He's talking about his disciples around him in that moment. But also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's you. That's me. He prayed for the church, the people that would be saved one day, people that would come Uh, into a relationship with Christ one day. He said, I pray for all of them. He said, I pray that they will all be one. Their unity. Just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, they are completely unified. And may they be in us so that, and here's the reason, so that the world will believe you sent me. 
He said, in order for the gospel to permeate the culture, in order for the gospel to go deep into someone's life, in order for the gospel to go around the world, he said, there must be a unified church. He said, I've given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. Do you get this theme of unity that he's praying for? Just like he and the Father are one. And by the way, when you get saved, the Bible uses so many different examples, so many different metaphors of how you are in Christ. He says, you are in me. He said, you become a part of the body of Christ. The Bible uses this metaphor. It says that when you get saved, you're in the Father's hand. And Jesus even went so far to say that he carves us into his own hand. There's no way he can ever forget us. Uh, We're in his hand. Jesus is in the hand of the Father. Uh, They are in us. We are in them. We're a part of that. And that is unity. And he goes on to say, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you have sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Now, I want you to let that sink in for a minute. God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. The second person of the Trinity, the only begotten son of God, the God, the Son from eternity past, and then he became human, and God the Son today. He said that they need to understand, they need to believe, they need to know that you love them just like you love me. I don't know about you, but that's overwhelming. I can't even hardly get my mind around that. But today, I want to just talk to you for a few minutes. I won't be very long. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about how that you and I are to dwell together in unity, how the church is to be unified, how Jesus prayed this prayer for us many, many years ago. First of all, we are unified in a great cause. Did you notice the cause that he talked about in this prayer? So that the world may know So that people can know this overwhelming, incredible gospel, this amazing love of God, so that they can know that you love them just as much as you love me. That that was truly a great cause. The great cause is to reach people for God's family. The great cause is the gospel going around the world that he forgives us, that he loves us, that he saves us when we ask. He came so that we could be a part of the family of God. That's a great cause. And he says the reason that a church is to be unified. Let let, let me talk about unity for a second. The thing about unity is that the bigger the cause, the greater the unity. Now, a lot of people think that unity comes from uniformity. Jesus never prayed for uniformity. And all you got to do is look at God's creation and see that. He made all different kinds of people. He made some tall and some short and uh, some thin and some not tall enough for their body weight. You know what I'm talking about? Um, You know, I I heard somebody say that the other day. So I'm not not fat. I'm just too short. All right. (laughs) And, you know, uh, God has a great diversity when it comes to his people. Look, there are 300,000 species of beetles. God loves creativity. He loves diversity. He loves all the people of the world. But this is the truth, is he loves you. Jesus came to save you. Jesus came to so that you can know. That's how much he loves us. We're to be unified in a great cause. So the point is, not that God wants everybody to look the same. That's not his desire. Uh, To be unified doesn't mean that you all have to like the same football team or like the same kind of food 
or like to vacation in the same place or like the same style of clothes or, or house, you know. I was in the uh, um, Atlanta airport and the Dallas airport this Friday and Saturday. I flew out for a meeting out in Dallas and um, wow, uh, I saw some very interesting clothing styles. Uh, some I'm like, you do realize this is a public place and that probably shouldn't be hanging out, all right, is all I'm saying, you know. But man, what, what a diversity in, in styles. Now, just because God wants you to be unified doesn't mean that you have to like the same colors or the same styles or the same kind of car. But the more unified you become, the greater the cause has to be. And we've got the greatest cause in the world. Therefore, we can be unified. You know, a, a lot of churches, when they forget this, you know what happens? I've heard churches that literally had fights, and, and I'm talking about literal fights in the church because of the color of the carpet. Some didn't want that color, and that color was chosen, and some people got mad about it. You know what that, you know why that happens? Because they're not unified around a great cause. We don't unify around carpet, folks. We don't unify around the style of music. We don't unify around even the type of programming. I can promise you, you come here long enough, there's going to be something about this church and probably, well, not probably, but definitely something that you don't like about me. And I know that's hard to believe, all right? But there are people that don't like everything about me, all right? But that's not what we unify around. We unify around Jesus Christ. And when we get a great cause, then we can be unified. Let me just give you an example of that. Um, you, you know the story of the Titanic, right? Uh, you know, on its maiden voyage, it sank. Uh, the unsinkable Titanic sank. And I heard they're making a Titanic part two. I have no idea what that's about because the stupid boat sank, all right? You're not going to get it up and get it sailing again. I don't know what part two could possibly be about. Uh, maybe it's the search for that big old giant diamond that went down into the ocean that I wanted to slap that old lady for throwing it into the ocean for. Anybody ever feel that way? It's like, no! Leonardo DiCaprio, it's okay for him to die, all right? Don't let him on the, uh, on the door, but don't throw that diamond in the ocean, right? Well, here's, I want you to think about this. If we're on the Titanic, all right, let's just use our imagination for a minute. And you know that we could miss the iceberg and not sink. Let me ask you a question. If you know that your life depended on it, I mean, it's huge, it's big, it's important. Would you really care what color napkins they used in the dining room? No. Would you really care if one of your pieces of silverware wasn't shined to your liking? No. Would you care what music they were playing, <laughs> you know, as the boat sank, you know? No, you know why? Because that's not important when you got a great cause. If the cause is to avoid, avoid dying in the middle of the ocean, nobody really cares if you wore a tuxedo or not. And in the church, this is what I want you to understand. We get so upset sometimes about things that are not important. You know why? Because we don't have our mind on the great cause. Because if you've got the great cause in mind, you don't care what color carpet it is. You're not that worried about programming or styles. You know why? Because you got your eyes on a great cause. Jesus said that the cause was for people to come into his family. Uh, in that same chapter, verses 1 through 4, and after saying these things, Jesus looked up into heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. Jesus has the authority to save. Jesus has all authority, all power. 
And we don't need to worry about the little piddly things in life, do we? If we know that Jesus is in control, he gives eternal life to each one that you have given to him. Everybody that comes to him, he says, I will give you eternal life. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one that you sent to earth. It's pretty simple, isn't it? He didn't say that you get eternal life by joining the church or by being a good person or being moral or keeping the Ten Commandments. He said you get eternal life through your faith, your belief in who God is and in the Son, Jesus Christ. That's how you get it. That's the big deal. And he said, I brought glory to you here on the earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. As a church... If we want the blessing that was talked about in Psalm 123, if we want that life of overflow that the psalmist talked about, if we want that anointing, you don't get it by getting your eyes on a little cause, by your, getting it on your agenda, on how you feel. No, no. We get that blessing, that anointing, that overflow in our lives by coming around a great big cause. Jesus has all power. He has the authority for this cause. He finished the work for this cause. So it's not your work, but it's his that matters. And Jesus gives us the faith for this cause. I often used to think, well, what if I don't have enough faith? Do you know the Bible tells us that if we will ask God, he'll give us faith? Even one man that came to Jesus, he said, I'll do this if you believe. And the man looked at him, he said, Lord, I believe you help my unbelief. If you've never prayed that prayer, that's a good prayer to pray. You know why? Because sometimes we look at our life and we even doubt our own salvation. What if I didn't pray right? What if I didn't ask right? What what if I wasn't holding my mouth right, you know? I went through a period like that in my life. Uh, When I was about 10 or 11 years old, somewhere in there, I saw the 1970s Christian film, which, by the way, uh, they're making some pretty good Christian films today, but for many years, I've refused to go watch a Christian film. Why? Not because I'm not a Christian, because they were awful, all right? I'm just saying. Uh, And this was one of those 70s films that is so bad. I'm talking about production value and and, and all this kind of stuff. It's so bad that you just can't take your eyes off of it. You know, one of those. And if you've never seen it, go on YouTube and you can see parts of it. Um, It was called The Burning Hell. And this movie was shown around in churches literally all over the world. And a lot of people were getting saved. But the story in it is that these two hippies from the 70s, okay, they uh, go to see this preacher, and he tries to win them to Christ, and they reject him, and they get out, and they're riding their motorcycle, and one of them gets in a wreck, and it cuts his head off. And they literally showed it in this Christian film, okay? And uh, then the rest of the story is about hell, okay, which is not imaginary, but it's a real place. But they tried to depict hell And it literally scared the hell out of me, okay? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Watch as a 10-year-old kid. And do you ever said this? Do you ever prayed this? For a long time, almost every night before I go to bed, I'd say, Lord, just in case. I'm asking you to save me. Just in case I didn't have enough faith. Just in case I didn't do it right. And... As I got older, my mom helped me. She said that, you know, um, Jesus promised never to leave us. And if you gave your life to Christ, he promised always to be with you. And even if you did go to hell, Jesus would have to go with you. And if Jesus went, it wouldn't be hell. I don't know, for some reason that helped me. But as I got older, I began to understand there is a silliness. Actually, it's not silly. It is an insidious plan of the enemy to defeat you because so many Christians think, well, what if I didn't do it right? Or what if I didn't say it right? 
Or what if I didn't hold my mouth right? Or what if I didn't have enough faith? Can I give you some really, really, really good news? You don't have to have enough faith. You just have to ask Jesus for the faith. And he has enough faith for all of us. Amen. You say, well, I, I don't know about that. That is actually scripture. It's true. God promises that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That calling is an act of faith. It's just asking Jesus is all it is. Asking Jesus. And the good news is that when it comes to this cause, Jesus, if you'll ask, he'll give you the faith to be saved. He'll give you the faith to be kept. He'll give you the faith to come around a great cause. You say, well, I don't know if I have enough faith. Just ask Jesus. Just ask God. He'll give it to you and he will bless you. He'll give you that faith to grow around a cause. I've seen it happen in my life. I got saved as an eight-year-old boy. Went through a period, you know, when I was younger, like I said, I saw some scary things and I really doubted my salvation. But then God gave me the confidence of my salvation. When I was 16 years old, I was at a youth camp, Christian youth camp, and I surrendered my life for the ministry. Uh, at 17 years old, I graduated high school and I moved away from home and went and started Bible college, started a series of years of my education and got into the ministry. When I got into Bible college, God began to grow my faith and I had enough faith to start being a youth pastor. And then I had enough faith uh, to continue to ask God to save family and friends and I had enough faith to grow. And the more faith I got, the more I asked God for faith, the more faith he gave me. And then I had enough faith to be a senior pastor, and I moved to Georgia. And then I had enough faith to become an evangelist and to travel all over the world and see thousands of people come to know Christ. And then one day I had enough faith. Kim and I said, you know what? We don't have any members. We don't have any money. We don't have any chairs. We don't have any sound equipment. We don't have any video equipment. We don't have any place to meet. But we believe that God wants us to start a church. And God took us out on that step of faith and God will bless you as well. You see, my point is this. Wherever you start, wherever you are, Jesus, here's what Jesus said. He said, a lot of people misquote what Jesus said. They say, Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. He didn't say the size of a grain of mustard seed. A lot of people say, well, Jesus said faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. That's not what Jesus said. Now, here's the point. It doesn't matter the size of your faith. Uh, a mustard seed, it starts out small, but you know what it does? It grows. And it grows tremendously. And here's the point. Maybe you need delivering. You need God to deliver you from a habit, a hurt, a hang-up, a fear, and you're like, well, I don't know if I've got enough faith. Well, here's the good news. Ask Jesus, and he'll give you the faith. And you can begin to grow. And if you have faith, that grows. It doesn't matter if you have doubts. In fact, if you don't have doubts, you don't need much faith. If you think that I have always been without doubt in pastoring this church or when we started this church, well, you've got a surprise coming because there's so many times I had doubts. I didn't know where the money was coming from. I didn't know where the people were coming from. I didn't know any of that. But you know what I did know? I did know that God is able, and I did know that if I'll just ask Jesus that he'll help me and praise God, my faith Grew. It was like a grain of mustard seed. It wasn't just the size. Sometimes it was about the size of a grain of mustard seed. But I gave it to God. I asked him to help me, and it grew. We're to be unified in a great cause. You want a church to be unified? Got to have the cause of reaching people with the gospel. That's got to be the big deal. That's got to be front and center. That's got to be our rallying cry. It can't be anything less than that. Anything less than that, and we become divided. You know what I believe? I believe Jesus knew the power of a unified church. A unified church changed the world. 
A unified church brings people to Jesus Christ. A church unified around the great cause will make a difference. A divided church is weak. A divided church is diffused. A a divided church will be just that. They'll divide and they'll have no cause and they'll look at the little things. We've all heard the story, read the story about the Apostle Peter. Remember, Jesus came walking on the water. It was a great storm. And Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to get out of the boat. And Jesus said, come on. And Peter got out of the boat. We know the story of how he was walking on water. But then he began to look at the waves. And and I don't blame him. I would have too. And when he did that, what happened to him? Began to sink. But you know what he did? He exercised faith. You know what he said? He said, our most gracious Father in heaven, thou who has given us life, thou has given us another day. No, he didn't say that. Some people think that if you're going to pray, you got to do that. You know what Peter did? He said, Lord, save me. And he did. He did. And I'll tell you this. You keep your eyes on the cause. You keep your eyes on Jesus. Instead of the little things that are around you, then you too will be able to walk on water. Now, the church that doesn't do that, you know what happens? They sink. They don't last. Why? Because they got little vision. Their eyes are on little things that don't matter. They, they divide over the color of carpet. But when we have our eyes on Jesus, we can get out of the boat and we can walk on water. And that's what God wants for your life. Well, I, I don't have a, a lot of time left. I've got two more points, okay? A, a church, Jesus, here's what he prayed. He prayed that the church would unify around a great cause. And here's the second thing he prayed. He prayed that the church would unify around a great change. A great change. You say, what does that mean? Well, the fact is, when you get saved, there's a change. You you see, Jesus did not save you to leave you. Now, we have a a saying that we say um, that we are the perfect place for imperfect people. And I truly believe that. And I believe that we have open arms for everyone. If the church can't be a place where sinners come to, if the church can't be a place where people who have problems come to, then where do they go? Where do they go? But Jesus loves you too much to leave you in the fear that you are struggling with. Jesus loves you too much to leave you in the addictions and in the bondage and in the hatred and in all that in your life that the Bible describes as the works of the flesh. He loves you too much. And so when he saves you, there is a great transformation that begins to happen in your life. And a church that begins to understand that, that we've got to love everybody. We've got to accept everybody. We've got to have open arms for everybody. But we love people too much not to tell the truth. We love people too much to leave them in their fear and in their bondage. There's a great transformation. I got so many stories I could tell about this. Um, I'm going to tell you a story of a man in this church. I'm changing the details a little bit to protect his privacy, but there was a man that was involved. I'll just call it the criminal underworld, all right? You can draw your own conclusions. But he was. He was knee-deep into it. In fact, I don't want to shock you, but he murdered a man, okay? Murdered a man. And, And several years ago, Uh, this man got an invitation to our church. At the time, we were called Avalon Church. And the truth is, here's a man that had taken a life. 
He was involved in the criminal underworld. Came to our church and heard <laughs> that, Jesus, that God loves him as much as God loves Jesus. That God had a plan for his life. That the good news is that he didn't have to be good enough because Jesus was good enough. And that man got saved. And that man got baptized. And uh, I'm changing a little of the details about his story to protect his privacy. But he became a person that no longer took life, but he gave it. There were people that he had known and people that were his friends and people that were involved in the same Silly, dirty stuff that he was involved in. And many, many, many of them came to our church and got saved. Now, what does that mean? It means that you haven't gone too far. You've not done too much for God to change you, for God to use you. And here's a man that Oh, he's not perfect. He'd be the first one to tell you that. But guess what? Neither am I, neither are you. Listen to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and I love this. It says, so dear brothers and sisters. By the way, he's not just talking about individuals. He's talking about the church. Brothers and sisters, okay? Here's what he said. I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Now, I was telling our small group about this. Um, there's, there are a couple of different thoughts about humanity. Some people believe that we are dual beings and that we are uh, spirit and body. There are Greek and Hebrew words that are used that are interchangeable with body and spirit and mind and heart, okay? So there are some people that believe that we're two parts, that we are a body, whatever that involves, um, our mind, our will, our intellect, our emotions, and a spirit. The spirit is the part of you that connects with God. Then there are others that believe that we are uh, a triune being. I happen to believe that, that we are triune in that we are body, soul, and spirit. And so I want you to get what Paul is saying here. He said, I plead with you to give your body. You know what he's talking about? This old flesh. In other words, listen, listen. <laughs> there are a lot of people that say they love Jesus, but their body doesn't ever show up. Hello, I just cut close. I realize I need to move on because some of you are like, oh, you need to talk about something else. No, 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 let, let me park here for a second. All right. The fact is, you can say you love Jesus, and if you don't ever show up, I'm not the one that's challenging you. God's word is the one that's challenging you. Here's what he said. Let me read it again. Give your willing spirit to God, loving to be there. And I'm there in spirit, just not in body. Is that what he said? Give your literal presence your literal body to God. In other words, show up. Your mind, your will, that's your decision-making ability, and your emotions. You know what God wants? He wants you. You know what God wants? He, yeah, he wants your emotions. And man, I love hearing good, I love our worship team. I was noticing today, all the ladies on stage, they were just so lovely. And then all of our men, they were wearing hats. All right, so uh, you thought I was going to say handsome, didn't you? All right, so. No, they are handsome. But here's the point. Don't miss it. You got to show up. The emotions, yeah, that's important. And God wants that. I love it, the emotions of worship. Uh, but he also wants my will, my decision-making ability. He wants me to give him my mind. In fact, he talks about it here. He says, um, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. But he, you know what he wants me to do? He wants me to show up. Guess what? You don't have to be 
to show up. You don't have to be perfect. Isn't that good news? He didn't say all rich people show up. He didn't say all the perfect people show up. He didn't say all of you that are gifted and that, you know, you're socially accepted by everyone and everybody respects you. And that's not what he said. He said, brothers and sisters, I want you to give your bodies to God. He wants us to show up. He says, why? Because of all he's done for you. (laughs) Isn't that a good enough reason? Why, why do you need to show up? Oh, because of what he's done for you. Well, what, what, why? Why do, you, why do they expect you to go to that church down there? Oh, is it because they want you to earn your way to heaven? Oh, far from it. No, 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 no. Because of all he's done for us. Why do, you, why do they want you to commit and to serve and to make a difference down there? Oh, because of everything he's done for us. That's why. I don't have to have accolades, and I don't have to have pats on the back. Those are nice. Don't get me wrong. But you know what I need? I need an awareness of everything he's done for me. And when I remember that, it's okay. It's okay if somebody forgot how to spell my name correctly. It's okay if I didn't get recognized. You know why? All he's done for me. All he's done for me. He wants me to come and see this great change. Anyway, he said, let them be a holy and living sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. By the way, it starts with giving your body. That's the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you. That's what we're talking about, that great change. By the renewing of your minds, by Let him transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You know that you never truly change until you change the way you think. I've been on so many diets in my life and lost weight and gained weight back. I'm probably going to die of cancer of the stretch mark, all right, because (laughs) the fact is it's been a yo-yo thing. You know what I'm saying? But you know the way to lose weight and to keep it off? Change what you think. You literally have to change your mind. That's what God wants to do with your life. He says, then you'll know God's will for you, which is good and pleasant and perfect. Well, let, let me wrap it up. He changes us through his word. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. By the way, Jesus himself did this. He said in verse 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself. The word sanctify means to set apart for special service. You know what Jesus did? He set himself apart for the cross. Which, by the way, I wish I had more time to talk about this. There really is no such thing as true, unified Christianity, really, truly pursuing God, really, really living for God apart from sacrifice. Now, I know that we all like to talk about the benefits and the joys and the blessings, and and I like that too. Okay, but let's not forget, let's not forget that Christianity, you know what it's really truly about? The sacrifice that Jesus made for you and me. And if you're not making any sacrifice, then you're probably not doing what Jesus said to take up your cross and follow him. Christianity is a call to service, yes. To worship, yes. But it's a call to sacrifice, Have you sacrificed any time, any personal things that you wanted to do to do something for somebody else? Oh, you're making some sacrifice to be here in church today. I get that. But is there anything in your life that you've ever done that costs you something? If you give, then you're taking that money that you could have spent on something else. Could have spent it on lottery tickets. Could have spent it on a tank of gas to go somewhere. Could have spent it eating out. And, and, and in, a, in a small way, this is a sacrifice to give. Okay? But have you ever sacrificed? Well, here's the last thing, and I'm done. We're to be unified, yes, in a great cause, 
in a great change, but we're to be unified in a great community. You say, what does that mean? Uh, talking about McDonough? No, I'm not talking about that. I used to live in Locust Grove, and it took me so long to get even out of my neighborhood that I was like, oh, and it was a beautiful place, and I thank God for it. But, man, I was so glad when we moved. I used to have to drive five miles to get to church. Now I have to drive almost 20. It takes me the exact same amount of time to drive the 20 from where I live now than it did to drive the five from where I used to live. So I'm not talking about where you live. The community is the church. It's to be a community of love. It's to be a community of fellowship. It's to be a community of grace. And it's to be a community of confidence. Confidence in what? In Jesus. The community is the not, church. Not me. Not, you know, if your confidence is in just in me, well, you're going to be disappointed. But if your confidence is in Jesus, listen to what he said. Father, I want these whom you have given to me to be with me where I am. <laughs> oh, you know, I've done so many funerals in my life. I know that seemed inappropriate how I laughed and into that. I was not laughing at I, forgive me. That was a that was a bad lead in. Um, I was laughing at what I was thinking about, okay? Uh, the fact is I don't have confidence in me. But I do have confidence in Jesus. And I've done a lot of funerals in my life that um, the person that I was doing the funeral for or the memorial service for, I had great confidence that they were with Jesus. You say, why was that? Were they perfect? You know, to this day, I've never done the funeral of a person that was perfect. Not yet. Uh, to this day, I've never done the funeral of someone that was without flaws. Don't think I ever will. But you know, the Apostle Paul who wrote, he said, we sorrow not as those who have no hope. Do you know where my hope lies? It's not in the person's life that I'm talking about. It's not in the leadership of our church, though I'm very confident in our leadership. You know where my confidence lies? It's not in my ability. It's not in how smart I am. My confidence as should yours, lies in Jesus. And as long as I got that, everything's gonna be okay. So you know what God wants from us? He wants us to be unified. You know what Jesus prayed for you? He wants us to be unified. Today, if you want to receive Christ, you can do so. Those online watching or those in the room, just ask Jesus to save you. Lord, save me. Lord, I'm asking you to come into my life. Lord, I believe in you. Say something like that. Mark it on the card. Mark it online. Let us know. We're going to baptize anybody that wants to be baptized. We've got several people we're talking to about getting baptized soon. Next Sunday, we got our next step class. I hope you'll come to it if you haven't been through it. It's at 1030 and just walk down this hallway there and it'll be there. But here's what I know. My confidence doesn't lie in a building or a program or even a group of people. My confidence, it lies in that which is unshakable. It lies in that which is the anchor for my life in the middle of my storm. And by the way, an anchor is not something that I hold on to an anchor is something that holds on to me. My confidence is in Jesus. And therein lies the power of unity. Amen. Amen, church. Let's stand and be unified and go forth. I love you. God bless you. I'll see you next Sunday. 
We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.